the nervous system I've broken up into two separate chapters, uh, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The uh, central nervous system consists of the brain uh, and uh, the spinal cord. And the uh, peripheral nervous system consists of everything else. So there's lots and lots of nerves outside of the brain and the spinal cord. And these are the nerves that, that innervate all of our body. When we talked about uh, the nerves that um, are all through um, the bone. Um, these are part of the peripheral nervous system. And part of talking about the peripheral nervous system is talking about what nerve cells look like uh, and how nerve cells function. And what I did last night is I sat down and I generated this thing here. And for some reason, putting this together just took me forever. Fortunately, I already had, this is a lipid bilayer right here. Fortunately, I already had my lipid bilayer model that I put together earlier, so I was able to steal that from a separate figure. And I've been getting into this business of making these uh, shapes that are um, a little bit uh, transparent. So I'm becoming more sophisticated in how I do this kind of stuff. And I decided that I would have, um, so these are gated channels. One of them is sodium specific and one of them is potassium specific. specific. And I decided to, so one's red, one's blue, and I decided to make that purple. It's kind of like in between. So what this is doing is, is trying to show you the absolute most basic concept, the, uh, the very, very, very most basic thing to know about how nerves work. And this is also applicable to how muscles work. So when we were talking about the nerve impulse or the impulse or the action potential propagating along the sarcolemma and down the transverse tubules, we're talking about the same concept here. This is the, the key to understanding how it is uh, that you can send um, a signal from one end of a cell to another end of the cell. So all of our cells have this thing called the sodium-potassium pump. And what the sodium potassium pump does is it pumps sodium potassium. Uh, but it does in a special way. So this is the cytoplasmic side of this membrane. And this is the extracellular side of the membrane. So this is the plasma membrane in between. So what the sodium potassium pump, it, it's responsible for active transport. So it requires energy to do this uh, movement of ions. Uh, and the energy in this case comes from ATP. So ATP, it's, it's this universal source of energy within cells. And what it, it happens is the ATP is hydrolyzed to ATP plus uh, inorganic phosphate. That's just how you get the energy out of ATP. Uh, and in the course of this, sodium ions are pumped out of the cell and potassium ions are pumped into the cell. And they're pumped against their concentration gradient, which is to say um, that you end up with way more sodium ions on the outside in excess and way more potassium ions on the inside. Uh, so you have a dearth of potassium ions on the outside. So you're pumping these ions against their concentration. And you're pumping them from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration. In both cases. And you end up with lots of potassium on the inside and lots of sodium on the outside. Uh, so anyway, we've got <coughs> constantly ongoing in our cells this pumping of sodium and potassium. And this, of course, uses up quite a bit of energy do this. And, and the result of this is we end up with lots of potassium inside the cells, lots of sodium on the outside of the cells. All of our cells do this. So what does dearth mean? Dearth means lack. Okay. A relative lack of, I don't think it quite means absence, but it might be synonymous with absence, but it's a relative lack of, it's the, the opposite of excess. Okay, the rest made sense, but I didn't know what that means. So on these excitable membranes, so cells that are excitable, uh, we also have these channels uh, that allow these ions to move with their concentration gradient. So this is not active transport. This is actually, uh, in this case, a sodium ion channel uh, that allows sodium to go from a region of excess of sodium to a region of a lack, relative lack of sodium. And this is a potassium channel, and this allows the excess of potassium, the potassium ions, to move from a region of high levels of potassium inside the cell 
to a reason of low level potassium. And that's passive transport. So we're constantly setting up this gradient, which actually sets up a voltage across these membranes. So we are negative on the inside and we're positive on the outside, ultimately, because we're, we're moving three sodiums out and two potassiums in. They have the same charge. And so you end up with a higher positive charge on the outside, a higher negative charge on the inside. When we have a nerve impulse, the nerve impulse is initiated by allowing sodium to move into the cytoplasm of the cell. That's called depolarization. This sets up what's known as a resting potential. It's a polarized membrane. It's a membrane with a voltage. It means you've got an excess of positive charge on the outside and therefore a negative charge on the inside. When we initiate a nerve impulse, we're initiating an action potential, and that means we're allowing sodium ions into the cell. That's why the one is there. That's because we're, we're initiating the process with the, this movement of the ions. And these ions move into the cell, and when they move into the cell, they take their positive charge and move it into the cell. So this negative charge on the inside, positive charge on the outside, suddenly we, we get rid of that negative charge. And that's called depolarization. We take a polarized membrane, we depolarize it. And that stimulates these potassium channels to release potassium out of the cell. So when we have the sodium come in, not only does it turn the interior, make it uh, less negative, but it actually overcompensates and makes it too positive. And that all means that we have a net negative charge on the outside. So when we open up this, the potassium flies out uh, to not only move with its concentration gradient from a region of high concentration to low concentration, uh, but to also move from a region that's now positively charged to a region that's negatively charged. Potassium is positively charged. It wants to get rid of positive charges. It wants to move towards negative charges. And that's the second thing that happens. So we have the sodium-potassium pump that maintains the separation of sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside. It also sets it up so that you have a negative charge on the inside and a positive charge on the outside. When you have the initiation of an action potential, if I was going to go back, but I can't easily, uh, at that neuromuscular junction, we have the neurotransmitters released. They went across the uh, synapse. They bound to receptors. The binding of those neurotransmitters to the receptor on the other side of the synapse actually opens up a gated channel that causes the sodium ions to come in. And it's a very special kind of setup with the uh, neuromuscular junction because any kind of binding at all is going to allow enough sodium to come in to trigger an action potential which is to say to, to trigger a, a sufficient a number of sodium ions on the inside that you uh, then release your potassium ions on the outside. Now once you've done that, basically what you've done is you've taken a very small section of the membrane of the cell, the muscle cell in that case, and you have switched the polarity so that the inside, instead of being negative, it's positive. And in, if, you, if you make the inside sufficiently positive, what that does will trigger a different kind of gated channel. It's actually a voltage gated channel instead of a ligand gated channel. A ligand gated channel, ligand is the neurotransmitter. Uh, the voltage is this change that happens because the sodium ion moves in. You, you, take, you, you end up with this small region of depolarization with the sodium ions inside now. It stimulates gated channels that are next to these small regions of depolarization and causes sodium ions to leak in there as well. And then that's followed with potassium ions leaking out. And then that causes, immediately adjacent to those channels, the leaking of sodium ions in and so on and so forth. Now it takes time for the sodium ions to go back out again. So the result is that Whereas you can stimulate sodium ions going in in one direction where you have not yet stimulated that, uh, you can't stimulate the sodium ions going in the other direction. So you get a one way, a directional propagation of these waves of sodium ions coming into cells and behind the wave of the sodium ion coming in, you have the potassium ions going back out and then behind that, you have the sodium-potassium pump constantly working, reestablishing your resting potential. 
So you have a wave going along. Sodium ions going in, behind it, potassium ions going out, behind that reestablishment of the resting potential. This can't go backwards, because it can't go backwards until the resting potential is reestablished, and that takes time. So it can only go in one direction. So when you have the binding of the neurotransmitter at the synapse, at the other side of the synapse, downstream side, uh, the postsynaptic side, you have the initiation of action potential, and then it spreads outward. And if this was a nerve cell, a neuron, it would spread down the axon. If it's a muscle cell, it spreads along the muscle, goes to the transverse tubules, and stimulates muscle contraction. But it's all based on the idea that you first establish this membrane potential, this resting potential, with too much sodium on the outside and too much potassium on the inside. And then you're able, very locally, to change that so that there's now too much sodium on the inside. And then that stimulates more sodium coming in. And then you just have a process that takes time to reestablish the original resting potential. So that membrane is temporarily unable to propagate the incoming sodium. And so the sodium propagation uh, or incoming can only move in one direction. And you get these nerve impulses, these action potentials that move along the surface of these cells and move from one region to another. These are essentially on-off switches, or if you're into computers, uh, binary, zeros and ones. The zero is when you don't have an action potential propagating across the cell, and the one is when you do have an action potential propagating across the cell. And that's it. That's what nerves are all about. They take an action potential, and they propagate it from one place to another. Muscles, they take an action potential, and they propagate it to where you actually get the contraction going on, and you end up with a contracting muscle. Now the trick is, particularly in terms of nerves, is under what conditions do you generate the action potential? And it turns out that that's more subtle and more complicated. The actual nerve impulse is not very complicated. It just means that you have taken a signal in one place, and then you simply propagate the fact that there's a signal. No, no qualitative aspect to it. It's zero or one. Either have a signal or you don't have a signal. If you have a signal, the signal is of, of sufficient strength. It is propagated from one end to the other. And then you can have further propagation of the signal across synapses. The complicated part with neurons is what actually stimulates the action potential. And what we'll see is that we can have these nerve cells that are all connected to each other. So we can have hundreds or even thousands of nerve cells connected to one downstream or postsynaptic cell. And you can have different combinations of, uh, of stimulations across synapses. Some of these stimulations can be positive stimulations. Some of these stimulations can be negative stimulations. Actually, can be inhibitory. And it will be some combination of multiple positive stimulatory stimulations uh, and insufficient amounts of inhibiting stimulations that together, if they add up to a sufficient amount of sodium ions going into the cell in a sufficiently small location, that you will end up with sufficient depolarization. And if you get that sufficient amount of depolarization, then pow, you end up with propagation of an action potential across or the length, down the length of the neuron. And if you don't reach that point, you don't get it. So this is the way our nervous systems are able to do the crazy things that our nervous systems are able to do. We're able to take lots of information and process that information at the point of a single neuron uh, by basically having information coming from different locations for different reasons that are either stimulatory or inhibitory. And whether we actually do something with that information um, is a function of the combination of information coming in. And then the neurons, that are stimulated, they go on to stimulate other neurons, but, but it's multiple other neurons stimulating other neurons. And we have information coming in from our peripheral nervous system, our special senses, and all the various nerve endings of, uh, that are throughout our body. Information is constantly coming in, and we've got processing, processing going on within the brain itself, as well as within the spinal cord.
And together, we're able to come up with decisions that we can then act upon. Uh, and one important way we act upon the decisions are by, in fact, stimulating our muscles uh, in order to have us do things, in order to have behavior. But also, uh, we can act upon these decisions by modifying uh, our bodies in, in other ways that uh, um, allow us to maintain homeostasis. So now we've come full circle back to muscles and, and in fact, back to homeostasis. And that 